Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining. Uh, we're going to give everyone about two minutes to hop on into the call, and then we will get started at the top of the hour. So feel free to grab, grab yourself water, coffee, whatever you need. All right, everyone, that was more like one minute, but we're going to go ahead and get started so we can keep everyone on time. My name is Stephanie Coppell. I am the Global Events Marketing Manager here at Vago. Um, we are hosting this event today with Morgan Franklin um, on procure, procure to Pay Optimization, say that 10 times fast. Um, before we get started, though, we do want to go over some of the housekeeping notes. That way you know how to get your CPE credits for today, since I know a lot of you are probably here for that. Um, so right off the bat, if you are joining us today with uh, on a mobile device, we do recommend that you join on your computer. It is how you will have the best experience. You can join on your mobile device. We do find that you have a better experience on your computer. So if you can join on your computer, please do so. Um, if you have any questions during the program, whether that's a troubleshooting question or for the presenters today, go ahead and use your Q&A widget. We will, I will be on the back end helping answer those questions. And then, of course, uh, our speakers will answer questions that you have during the program. You will receive a copy of today's presentation uh, via PDF form. You can either download that now. It is in your resource widget. Or you can wait until you get your email. You'll be able to download it then as well. So today's program is for one full CPE credit. In order to obtain that, you must attend for at least 50 minutes of the session, answer three polling questions. We do have one extra, we have four just in case. Um, and then last but not least, complete your post-program evaluation, which is located in the platform in your toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Once you complete all of that, you will be able to download your certification from your, um, from your certification widget, which is to your left, your far left. Um, and it will have a green check mark that appears for you so you will know that you obtain your CPE credit. This is what your screen should look like. You see us in your left-hand corner with our presentation in the center. Uh, like I mentioned, you have your resource widget, which has the presentation for today. It also has upcoming CPE events where you can earn more certification credits if you need them. Um, and then that CPE certification widget, which is what I was just talking about. Once you see that green check mark at the end of this event, that means you can download your certification. Last but not least, polling questions. Um, polling questions will not pop out. They will not pop up. They will appear in this slide area. Uh, so you will select your answer from the list of options and please make sure you hit submit. If you do not hit submit, your response likely wasn't recorded. Um, so again, highlight your answer, click the one that you want to respond with, click submit, and then you will have submitted your response and that will count towards your polling questions. So with that, I'm going to pass it off to our speakers today. Um, please enjoy the program. If you have any questions, drop those in the Q&A box. If you're, if you're speaking, you might be on mute. Uh, um, thanks for that, Stephanie. Hi, my name is Sean Bonadeo. Uh, I'm a partner at Morgan Franklin, and I'll be your moderator today. 
Uh, I have about 25 years experience across all manners of finance and accounting, um, including some standards development at some stage, which uh, may have caused some pain for those on the call and I apologize for. Uh, these days I consider myself a recovering accountant though, um, and I've spent the last decade or so really focused around tra transformation, helping companies navigate major change externally, acquisitions, carve-outs, IPOs, as well as focusing on driving change yeah. internally, looking for ways to improve the core operating model, which probably ties a little bit more to today. I know we want to dive into the real content today, um, but before we do, a quick rundown of what we'll be covering. I'll set a little bit of the broader context of uh, the market and how it's relevant to the content today. Um, from there, we'll set the scene around what we think of um, as P2P and some obstacles that uh, people encounter in this process. Uh, and then build on that really to focus on how do clients think about taking some best practices and leveraging those to drive forward transformation. Um, but before we get too far into that, let's uh, meet our speakers. So joining me on the call today, we have Nathalie and Brendan. Uh, Nathalie DeRose is a senior architect at Morgan Franklin, primarily focused on the implementation and optimization of ERPs. With a decade of experience though, while the service her role is quite technical, it's really built on the understanding and commitment of exceptional process design and driving client outcomes. Brendan Che brings over 10 years of finance and accounting experience with a focus on business transformation through process or optimization. Brennan has a keen focus, particularly on how data and automation can be at the front and center around target operating model, which we'll dive into a little bit today. So let's set the context. So despite persistent fears and challenges in the US, the US economy is generally doing okay. And we're even seeing some real uptick in movement in the transaction space, including IPOs after a very slow 2023 seen a lot of dry powder, um, particularly in the PE space, starting to be spent. Another thing we're seeing is a slowdown on people moving between their jobs, with people quitting their jobs at the lowest rate in the last four years, and the labour market remains strong with continued job growth. That said, we are in an election year. So why do all these things matter? Well, the uncertainty from the election year has companies really wanting to focus on operational control and efficiency and trying to make sure that they're prepared for whatever could happen. In parallel, for some organizations, the stabilizing economy and the increased movement in transactions will be driving them to be looking at cost reduction and value creation as they look to become a more attractive commodity in the market. And finally, and we'll dive into this a little bit later more, the labor market shift shows a sign of employees looking to get more out of their current job as opposed to moving to the next one to get that new experience. So how do we keep them engaged and growing in their seat? Nathalie, let's start with the P2P overview. Nathalie. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Okay, Let's take a look at the procure to pay overview. An extended end to end procurement process begins really with strategic sourcing. In this phase, uh, companies want to be smart and thorough in the extended buying process. You want to save money, improve quality, and build a relationship really with your suppliers. You want to move into the next phase where we're looking at the contract management process. This is where you want to ensure your contracts are, or agreements are, are fair, uh, followed by uh, properly from start to finish. You want to conduct your due diligence with proper contract negotiations, giving your business a solid foundation to begin the automation process. Next, you wanna move into procurement. This is the vendor management process. This gives the business the ability to procure vendor contracts, the requisition process, including purchase orders and item catalogs. 
Next, you, you want to move into the, the extended procurement cycles, which involves purchase order approvals, receiving, and inspecting. From here, we will move into the last two phases of the, the procurement cycle. This is your invoice to pay. In this cycle, we'll move through uh, complex processes such as three-way matches. We'll move through two-way matches, complex approvals process, as well as we'll look through the processes that involves reporting, self-payment, self-service portals for payments. You'll note that on this graphic, we're showing both enterprise procurement system, ERP as a technology overarching all these processes and associated reporting. This will obviously depend on your environmental and operating model. What we do know of these processes and effective leverage of your ERP and where appropriate, a secondary point system give optimal efficiency and key information to the organization around these areas. Look like Natalie. Uh, looks like Natalie, you still there? Thank you, Sean. Just uh, moving down to the next slide. The P2P maturity scale. The, this maturity framework helps organizations to understand their current stage and transform the journey and identify key focus areas for enhancing maturity. When we look at this graphic, this structure, structured level describes how well your organization produce reliable and sustainable leading capabilities to grow over time and produce repeatable success. These areas range from maturity, least maturity to most maturity. Now, when we think about maturity model and based on the company's needs and approaches, these varies. Complex maturity models takes into consideration all aspects of the P2P process, includes strategic sourcing, contract management, supplier management, requisition management, purchasing, receipts, invoice processing, and payments. A, flexi a flexible maturity model is not a fixed endpoint. While achieving an optimized assessment, it is not necessarily all for all organizations. The model provides a method to identify the current state and envision the desired future state. Now, in doing this, there is always a cost-benefit analysis. When determining the appropriate level of maturity, it is crucial to perform a cost-benefit analysis for each focus area. Not all organizations require specific automation if they do not align with the business needs. The Morgan Franklin team uses the maturity model to visually compare the company's current state with its peers and identify maturity for areas for improving and guiding towards an ideal procurement maturity state. One of our more recent clients, a public company in business for over 30 years, had a very ad hoc process. And we used the maturity scale model and delivered an assessment that identifies opportunities, pain points, and gaps across the procurement process. This then led to a roadmap 
for the company to grow into an advanced stage. So in taking a look at this graphic, we could see from start to finish, the maturity, using a maturity scale tool is great to align with leading practices and expose common pain points that will help your company to get from current stage into transforming you and, and helping you to identify focus areas for enhancing your maturity levels. Thanks, Dr. And I guess just for clarity, I, I think there's a couple of people that made the comment that Sean doesn't look like an athlete. Uh, she's having some uh, <laughs> video issues. So we, we've turned off her video to make sure that the audio is coming through, Chris. So you will unfortunately have to look at me, um, but, but you'll be here an athlete throughout. Um, but talking about our presenters, Brendan, we now know what good looks like, um, but where do we often see issues with that? Yeah, not surprisingly, Sean, a lot of the client uh, issues that we see are very similar from client to client across the, the P2P landscape. Um, and they can really be classified into three categories. We've got people, data, and process. Uh, with people, I think P2P functions and organizations more broadly have challenges fully maximizing employee talents. In this digital age where we have so much access to so much information, we're constantly learning and digesting and analyzing and reacting to information in real time. And people want this in their jobs too. Um, if we just take a look at strategic uh, sourcing, for example, finding the right strategic partner, it's absolutely critical. It plays a massive role in being able to provide quality products to customers and strategic sourcing requires its own. So it requires analysis and strategy and relationship building. Yet people that far too often, those competing priorities are, are typically uh, edged out by manual processes and, and people don't have the attention to be able to, or the time to be able to build these relationships. It, re it results in high turnover, uh, leads to limited resourcing availabilities and ends up with uh, unreliable or underperforming supplier performance. Uh, across procurement, we see a lot of significant data challenges, particularly around an organization's maintenance and management of master data. Uh, this often can lead to inaccurate item catalogs or duplicate vendor records, which can be particularly painful given the opportunity that that creates for duplicate payments. And then in, in process area, our clients face many challenges of being bogged down in manual processes. Uh, this is particularly prevalent across procurement direct and indirect buying, and then also the invoice and pay process. Uh, it's understandable, right? If we look at the entire P2P control framework, it's centered around creating, reviewing, and matching what was historically paper documents. So many clients still rely on paper requisitions from which a buyer manually creates a PO to which it's manually matched against a paper invoice that was manually set by, sent by the supplier. So unfortunately, uh, the days of filing cabinets full of vouching packets Packets is still the, the operating environment for many of our clients today. So this not only creates process inefficiencies, but it subjects the process to manual error and manual circumvention of control, um, which poses challenges with compliance with both internal and external policies. Thanks, Brennan. Now, let's give the audience a little bit of a chance to have their say on some things. Now, the good thing about our polling questions is there is no right or wrong answer. But um, as Stephanie said at the top, it is important that you get them in uh, for your purposes of your CPE. So um, let's hear the first one. Which area of the P2P process do you find most challenging at your company? A, sourcing, B, procurement, C, direct, indirect, invoice processing, or D, other? So, Brendan, what do we think people are going to have as an answer to this one? <laughs> uh, all of the above, if it were an option. I think particularly <laughs> in the invoice processing, uh, as I said, it is super manual intensive, lots of paper involved, lots of opportunity for improvement, but also lots of challenges. All right, we're about 75% of the way through. I'll give us another 10 or so seconds for people to try and get their CPE in. And then we'll move across. All right. 
So pretty close to what you were saying there, I guess, Brennan, right? It is feels like all of the above. It's pretty even across across the area. Okay. So we know how to assess the maturity and some of the obstacles people might encounter. But Brendan, how do we get companies from where they are now to where they want to be? It's a question that, that of course, we get asked a lot, and it's really uh, of strategic imperative. We always work with our clients and encourage them to take an end-to-end -end approach to transformation. Trying to transform in a silo will often address the symptom of a particular challenge, but it falls short of addressing the cause. So instead, we work with our clients to address challenges in support of a larger strategic objective. And it begins with defining what is that strategic objective? What is the underlying reason for change? And once we establish that objective, we work with our clients to assess how the current end-to-end -end operating model supports or falls short of supporting that strategic vision. Um, so an analysis of the, the operating model, it's, it's critical because it's the foundational blueprint. It tells us how the P2P function operates holistically. And when we evaluate this against that strategic vision, it uncovers varying degrees of improvement opportunity. So operating model is it's categorized into six dimensions. And depending on the types of challenges being faced, uh, clients will evaluate some or all six of the dimensions. But typically we start with process design because it's a great way to help us understand what are those operating steps in the global procure to pay uh, function? How are they executed and where is there or is there not process standardization? Uh, so this, pro this evaluation often uncovers pretty simple uh, process redesign opportunities that can be implemented fairly quickly to yield uh, immediate benefits. And we also identify what are the roles and responsibilities within those activities. And that informs an evaluation of the organizational structure and also the people supporting those activities. It helps us understand what are the organization's skill sets and capabilities and what's required to deliver that next strategic vision. So it helps us understand what's the P2P function's capacity to attract and to recruit top performers. Then we'll review the, the technology uh, architecture, which will help us identify where can we optimize what we have now, right? What can we do to optimize our current ERP functionality? And where is there opportunity to enable new technologies, uh, such as those that Natalie will, will, will go over in a bit, which can really streamline processes and free up a lot of, of human capital. Um, that is typically, evaluating technology is typically a natural transition into an assessment of the organization's broader data and reporting. Um, and so this includes a, a maturity assessment of data strategies, data literacy, and reporting capabilities, which is more critical now than ever before, right? Because data quality is directly correlated to the insights generated through business uh, intelligence and analytics tools that are being used to support management decision making. So as organizations, as they go and generate more data, we find ourselves at a critical juncture for governance and control. Uh, companies need to make critical leaps now to protect their data through strong governance practices, but governance extends beyond data, right? We also need to be diligent in making sure that we're complying with both our internal and our external uh, regulations and policies. So an evaluation of this governance framework, it, it helps us understand how well positioned the organization is to respond to risks. And then once we've been able to establish an understanding and assessment of that operating model, it's important to determine what's the best delivery approach, whether it's in providing those services in-house or carving some or all of it out for a more efficient outcome. For example, in P2P, carving out the vendor onboarding uh, process will, will give the suppliers the ability to onboard themselves to the use of self portals. Uh, so these six dimensions are, are, are crucial for aligning the organization's Strategic goals with strategic operating model. Thanks, Brennan. And I guess you talked about the strategy at the start. I guess I'm getting a bit of feedback, maybe. Um, one thing that's pretty important about setting that strategy and understanding why you want to make that change is, is also thinking about the guiding principles about how you make that change. Because something that may be uh, a decision that helps one stakeholder may hurt another. And so understanding why are you doing this or thinking about cost versus benefit. So understanding that strategy at the start is going to be really helpful in being able to make effective and consistent decisions 
in the target operating model that Brennan was just talking about. The other thing that's worth noting is each one of these things can be taken as a silo if you really want to focus on just your org design. We do think it's best to look at all the six lenses, um, but there are certain times where you really just feel like you need to make that change around that. But Brennan, let's talk a little bit more about how you go about doing this. Yeah, John, first off, I think it's a really important note about the guiding principles. I'm uh, working with a client now, we're in year two of the transformation, and I constantly go back to the guiding principles. It is our North Star, it guides everything we do, and it's a critical component of it. Um, in, in terms of transforming to a target operating model, we take a four-step approach. Assess, design, implement, and optimize. So assess is all about understanding the current state conducting workshops to map out the end-to-end -end P2P process to identify uh, those key activities and what the supporting technologies are. But it's also really important to the extent practical to get all the stakeholders in a room and start to understand what are the pain points and more importantly, what's the underlying root cause of those pain points. Because with that current state understanding, you can begin to design a future state that alleviates those pain points by addressing the root cause and enabling the organization to capitalize on, on those opportunities for better strategic delivery. So during the design phase, we gain stakeholder buy-in uh, to make sure that everybody is aligned on the priorities for that future state roadmap. This includes ensuring that all critical business requirements are satisfied in that future state uh, model. And then we get to the fun part, right? Then we get to implement. This is where we start to, to, to see the design come to life. Um, we always encourage our clients to start the implementation phase with some quick wins. Get some quick wins under your belt, help grow the transformation momentum, build that support, and you'll be off and running. Um, proactively mobilizing subject matter expertise, a critical component of implementation, because implementations, especially technology implementations, require coordination across various IT and business stakeholders. And then one thing that cannot be understated in implementation is uh, communication. We want to make sure we communicate effectively and often, but it's also crucial to keep in mind that a key piece of listening, of, of, of communicating is listening. So we want to take that time to hear from our stakeholders, internal and external, and make sure that everybody's aligned and driving towards that outcome. And then obviously once we implement, we're not done, right? We want to uh, continue to improve in the optimization phase. So remember that the target operating model is meant to support that strategic vision. So the larger P2P vision changes, we need to make sure that the operating model changes to support it. And that's just done through uh, fostering a continuous improvement mindset and culture. And so Morgan Franklin plays a critical role in this because going across all four phases, uh, we ensure effective change management, but also uh, effective project management to support the transformation effort. Thanks for that, Brennan. So when designing our target operating model in Athlete, what would you suggest are some of the best practices around P2P that clients should consider? Nathalie, it might not be coming through. Hey, Sean, am I unmuted? Could you tell? You're good now, yep. Yeah. Here at Morgan Franklin, thank you, Sean. Uh, here at Morgan Franklin, we have in-depth experience with uh, targeted and enterprise-level customers giving us the opportunity to curate best practice across the industry as it relates to P2P. And when it comes to technology transformation, a common questions we get from a lot of our leaders is, uh, what are your best practices? Uh, we all know that optimizing the, the, the supply chain with proven methods uh, will provide efficiency and sustainability across the procurement process. Uh, here are a few factors that we, success factors that I would propose would be a part of uh, would be implemented across several companies here at Morgan Franklin. Uh, strategic sourcing, which involves researching and conducting your due diligence. Uh, this involves streamlining and conducting sourcing, documentation, developing, negotiating different processes across your vendors. 
uh, leveraging globalization and reg regionally and local contacts. Uh, on the procurement side, this involves Uh, Natalie, I think we lost you again. Yeah, my slides aren't coming through. Natalie, do you want me to keep on going? Uh, I might jump in for Nathalie just to sort of keep things moving. Um, so when we think about direct and indirect, you know, why should PO be mandatory? You know, the key thing is that this will give you a little bit of control over your budget, prevent fraud, hold your vendors accountable. So the idea is to make that required. Secure your contracts to negotiate term discounts. When we think about invoice to pay, automate and centralize your invoicing process provide vendors with clear payment terms and centralize your payment management and provide self-service portals for your vendors. Push some of the work down towards them. And all of these combine to really make your secret source. So those are things when we think about best practices, but obviously, as I talked about at the start, a lot of companies are interested in how do we think about cost reduction when it comes to our target operating model with regards to P2P. Nathalie, how's your mic going? Okay, I might keep on going then. So cost reduction is critical for improving profitability, gaining a competitive advantage and building a strong foundation for sustainable business success. We all know that. So here are a few areas that several of our clients are focusing on today to reduce costs and benefit from those strategic relationships. Now, I know some of these are cliche. Um, however, the strategic approach and putting the right practice, these are effective methods. You really want to eliminate, consolidate, standardize, automate, or adapt. So what do we mean by that? Let's start with a very basic cut. Remove all your redundant expenses. Think of it like removing unnecessary subscription fees and unplanned uh, purchases. This is the low hanging fruit that gives you the quick win to empower you for the bigger, more optimal steps. And I think that's what a lot of people in this call are looking for at times, right? We don't want to go and take on this huge project. How do we take on something that helps us start, right? How do you start? You start with that first step. Next, it's a lot easier to consolidate your costs and begin to unify expenses across all departments. And then you build upon the above, automating across all the areas of the company that will be easily adapted. If your internal efforts are impractical, then consider outsourcing to achieve the same cost reduction strategy using offshore or nearshore resources. This is, where service, this is where the service delivery model begins. Accounts payable and payment processing are the most cost-effective areas to really outsource. So with that, we have our next polling question. What is the primary driver for optimizing your P2P process? Is it cost reduction? A, cost reduction. B, improving efficiency and speed. C, enhancing compliance and control. D, better supplier management relationship, or E, increasing data accuracy, visibly, visibility, and integration. Now, Brendan, I will call on you again to see what you think we might hear here. Yeah, I, again, no, no right answer uh, or wrong answer here, Sean. I think one thing that is important to note when we're talking P2P optimization is the ability to enhance compliance, whether that's internal compliance or external compliance with external regulations, which is becoming increasingly more important with ESG standards. So I think enhancing compliance and control is a critical, critical element of, of P2P optimization. Awesome. Well, give it a couple more seconds and see if you are right. Actually, while we're waiting, uh, there's a couple of questions that have come through in the Q&A. Um, 
One is around if there's any best in breed softwares, which thankfully we will be getting to in a couple of slides time. Um, and then the second uh, was, I guess, a clarification on my required PO for all purchases. I guess I think what I would recommend is that all companies require PO, um, but that you would have uh, thresholds and delegation and, and different levels to really make that the most effective that it can be. All right. No surprise. I mean, they're the ones that are on people's mind. That totally makes sense. Um, I do think that that last one will, you know, if we did this webinar in a year's time, may change and may end up being a bit of a higher score. All right. So, uh, just checking, Nathalie, how's your mic going? Okay. I'll, uh, I'll keep on going and hope that she can sort it out as we go. So when it comes to selecting optimization tools, clients do get very overwhelmed by the options um, and the vendors and the features in the marketplace today. The best practice is to use a thorough supplier selection assessment to determine which tool aligns with your business needs. Today, we have a little bit of a breakdown to make your selection and choice a little bit simpler. We have planned the tools in sort of two buckets, small and targeted or large enterprise. And what does that mean? Typically, the difference between the two uh, is really going to be driven by, uh, sorry, the levels of scalability, features complexity, implementation requirements, and cost. Often the small and targeted solutions are great for moving forward, um, for not having an automation to automation, or looking at a very specific part of the process to drive that. These are typically uh, turnkey solutions, when your company can essentially plug and play, meaning they are very basic configuration for your business, unique geo coding and segmentation. They're cost competitive, uh, effective, approvals are simple and companies will experience a quick ROI from the reduction in manual processes, like vendor bill approvals being moved from using emails or missing invoice attachments. When it comes to those large enterprise solution, it's a situation where you've outgrown your current approach. You're ready for globalization. You're ready for bigger dollar amounts. You're ready for a full solution across your whole P2P area, where you've got multiple level of uh, approval situations. You need scalability. You need risk management. You need real-time data to help drive those decisions. And you're in multiple locations. These enterprise solutions require a lot more time to plan, design, and implement. They are configured to the business unique complexity and are typically driven uh, more across the automation of the company and the procurement cycle. So if we go back to that previous slide, I've given you a little bit more of the explanation of what large is versus small and how we think about those different areas. Um, and these are some of the main names. This isn't the whole selection, uh, just some of the ones that we see more often. Um, and then as you'll see in the slides that we share, we've given you, I guess, a couple of examples of those solutions in practice. And in that you can see with Airbase, we've obviously gone, this is a specific um, uh, discrete thing that they were trying to do around the PO aspect, uh, whereas the Oracle Procurement Cloud was a much bigger uh, activity that was being done, which lines up with the, the broader context around looking at these solutions with different lenses. So, Brendan, how do we automate all of this? <laughs> yeah, before I get into to the, to the how and what that looks like, I just want to re-emphasize that end-to-end -end operating model optimization is the true strategic value driver. So organizations who are automating just to automate typically see far less return on their investment than organizations who are incorporating automation as part of a larger value-driven strategy. And when we evaluate uh, automation in the context of a larger strategy, we could be, see really powerful um, efficiency gains. We could see risk mitigation and, and, and improved compliance all of which is going to drive significant cost savings across the, the P2P landscape. But when it comes to automation uh, itself, and especially across finance, I think P2P was an early adopter, particularly around using workflow or optical character recognition, which you might know as OCR or RPA, which is robotic process automation. But now with the advent of AI and machine learning and advanced analytics, it's fueling even more automation opportunity. And many of these features are, are native, uh, in the solutions that Sean highlighted. But let's take a, a look and assess the impact on the, the key P2P areas, and we'll start with strategic sourcing. 
I talked earlier about how finding the right strategic partner is critical and it requires uh, analysis. Well, fortunately, data analytics can be really powerful in helping us. Um, they could be proactive in forecasting supplier risk during the, the selection process, but it can also help us analyze supplier performance or analyze market trends to assess the impact on pricing strategies. So relying on the technology to conduct a lot of that data analysis frees up the time for our people to focus on those value add activities, like working directly with suppliers to strengthen those relationships or negotiate better contracts or identify cost savings opportunities. Sean had mentioned on the last uh, slide that he would expect to see uh, strengthening relationships to, to move up on that scale in, uh, in future uh, webinars. And that's because once we get to, to get some efficiency gains in the organization, that's where the focus turns. When it comes to managing suppliers, uh, machine learning and, and generative AI can be leveraged to streamline the contract review process by relying on AI to review contract compliance and compare those critical terms against what the actual performance is. And in doing so, this can help um, identify potential revenue leakage or again, increase that ESG compliance. Uh, Self-service portals are becoming an increasingly more popular means to manage suppliers because they offer that centralized platform for suppliers to complete the onboarding or communicate shipment notices or request payment. Uh, so it drives a lot more transparency and visibility while also enhancing the data integrity because it's suppliers who are coming in and entering their onboarding information, uh, not multiple people within the same organization spread throughout the globe. When it comes to managing requisitions um, all the way through processing payments, we see a lot of, this is where we see a lot of the early adoption, right? So I mentioned uh, workflow and OCR and, and RPA, but those technologies continue to evolve and get better. Um, for example, workflow technologies that can drive requisition compliance by automatically identifying specific uh, requisition scenarios and then routing it for approval. But the, the benefit of workflow is compounded when it's, when it's coupled with uh, OCR and RPA. So RPA can take that requisition it can automatically create the PO and send it for approval. And then workflow, RPA, and OCR together can streamline AP processing, right? You can do the automated matching system and stage payments for payment by their due date, which is going to help maximize working capital. So when you take all of these, these automation opportunities together, you can drive some pretty significant uh, optimization across the end-to-end -end P P cycle. That's fantastic, Brennan. I think some of this seemed, you know, a few years ago, like, you know, science fiction, but I think it's just so clear and around all the time now. Um, yeah. So when we think about this, what would you say are some of the preconditions for success? There's one in particular. Automation is only made possible through high quality and reliable data. So data, it's, it's the, the fuel of the, the automation engine. And just like any engine, the cleaner the fuel, the better it operates. So bad data runs the risk of ineffective automation or unreliable insights. So when we work with clients around automation, the first step is always to do an evaluation of data and data governance practices um, to establish a strong data foundation across P2P. It's imperative that we define all the data elements that are feeding the P2P process and then trace that, that data lineage back to the, the source systems. It'll help us not only identify where the bad data is that needs to be cleaned, but it will also help us identify those disparate systems and, and, and figure out which ones need to be integrated together to establish that clean single source of truth. And then once the data is cleaned, it's, it's all about establishing a, a culture for continuous maintenance, which is equally as important, right? And so clean data not only enables automation, but it also unlocks analytical capabilities. Uh, it allows organizations to visualize descriptive analytic capabilities. So that's more of a reactionary what happened type of review. This is where KPI dashboards are really great for tracking historical performance. Uh, but then clean data also allows you to scale from descriptive into predictive and into uh, prescriptive analytics, which is a more proactive analytical approach. Let the data tell us what happened in the past so it can predict what's going to happen in the future and then also can tell us how to respond to it. So continuing the, the supplier, supplier performance example, 
Um, the predictive analytics models can help us analyze that historical information to predict which suppliers are likely to deliver high quality uh, material. And then they can actually do scenario uh, planning between different supplier options to prescribe which supplier is the best to choose for that partner. So as the data gets better, it enables us to move up that automation scale and ultimately into artificial intelligence and, and next-gen technologies. So as organizations optimize their data quality, they can begin to, to adopt technologies like AI, which can take us from automated to autonomous. For, for example, when an order is placed, AI can actually trigger a series of actions across the business, from order management to seamlessly uh, communicate with inventory and procurement and AP to really, really streamline that process. And with the right data, AI and machine learning can generate insights for decision-making very similar to how you ask GPT to generate an answer. Um, so imagine a scenario where AI models can integrate your organization's data with third-party external data, such as commodity pricing or weather patterns to understand impacts on your organization's expected future per purchasing. Uh, it's really getting us thinking ahead and moving, moving ahead to more value add activity. So the future of AI, especially in P2P, is it's truly remarkable. But again, it all begins with that strong data governance. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice looking pyramid that totally makes sense there. And I think, you know, we've got a couple of questions that have come through um, around some of the technology. And one of them was asking about, you know, do we recommend RPA in a small enterprise? And I would say, and I'd love to hear your thoughts on this, Brendan. I mean, yes, uh, I think that it's democratized to such a level. Like I was doing projects sort of maybe a decade ago on sort of Fortune 500 companies that were really leaning into some of this. But I think that where we are now is that there is a scalability and efficiency on it that it is applicable to everybody, um, but is required to have that, uh, that strong foundation that you talked about. No, that, that's exactly right. And I think a lot of times we hear about RPA and OCR and we want to think about what vendors can create something for us. But it's also important to keep in mind that a lot of this technology, it's already native in some of the, the systems. So for instance, some of those P2P systems um, where you're taking advantage of the technology without having to work with a partner to build it in-house. Yeah. Okay, let's move with all that talk about technology. Let's have a technology-based polling question. Which automation or AI functionality are you most interested in? Is it A, self-service portal functionality, B, standardization and governance, C, reporting and data analytics, so strategic sourcing, for example, D, OCR and robot, robot process automation, RPA, we were just talking about some of that stuff, um, or E, machine learning and generative AI. So we've got about 9% of them in there. Still coming through. It's a, there's a lot of words in that question. Chance for people to, to catch up and read. Um, Brendan, I know you talked a little bit around um, data cleanup and maintenance and all that sort of stuff. Do you have any points of view around you know tools that people use to help expedite that? There, there. It's all based on the the organization, right? What's the best fit for the organization? There's plenty of tools that can come into your system and understand what type of, of data uh, process that you have, and actually be prescriptive in, in identifying areas to clean up that data. Um, but it also starts with a master data team. So if you have a master data team that's able to conduct a lot of that analysis, you can get really ahead in the process. Awesome. All right. What were our answers? Well, look at that reporting and data analytics. That's almost a little bit different to what we had heard earlier on where that was less of a focus, but I, I don't think it's necessarily contradictory. It's just thinking about things in different ways, right? So when we were talking about um, what people are most focused on, it may be more around cost reduction, but what would they think they're gonna get out of automation or AI? It's gonna be at least at this stage around sort of maybe that reporting and data analytics and then the OCR and RPA stuff that we've seen you know, around for a long time. Okay, that's great. So let's talk a little bit around the technology enabled P2P transformation, Brendan. Yeah, I think there's, you know, we, we talked about the incredible uh, opportunity for things like cost reduction and efficiency gains and, and overall increased transparency and visibility, which I know is a, a massive struggle for a lot of, of companies. So we 
really focused on how do we reduce costs most importantly, but how do we also reduce risk and gain those efficiencies? Um, so I think that the important thing about P2P optimization is that it makes you more agile, right? It frees up our people to focus on more important tasks and it arms you with the analytical insights, just like the survey showed, arms you with those analytical uh, insights to be able to make smart, strong business decisions. And that's really a, a huge value driver in, in optimizing the P2P function. Thanks, Brian. So this has all been great, but I think one thing we talked about early on was around people. Um, and, and I think one of the things that is a secondary aspect of this in some respects is when you automate and streamline aspects of your P2P function, this allows those resources to free up capacity. This in turn allows them to shift their focus from manual operational tasks to strategic initiatives. Instead of supporting business, they can help actually guide the business activity and be driving and providing guidance to people. So a couple of examples would be, you know, building and maintaining strong relate supplier relationships to enhance service quality and pricing, as well as proactively identifying and mitigating supplier risk to prevent supply chain disruptions. People don't currently have the time to do that, but if you can help free up some of these manual tasks with the automation and the aspects that we've talked about around process improvement, they have the time to do that. You know, they could analyze spending patterns, uncovering cost saving opportunities and facilitate regular contract reviews to prevent revenue leakage. This is more value added work without increasing capacity or costs. Consideration of cost saving opportunities uh, by consolidating venues and leveraging better purchasing power. These are huge impact items that can actually make a massive difference to the business, but you need the time and space to invest in them. And if you're not driving an optimized P2P process, your team's gonna be not have the capacity to be able to spend some time on these. So where do we start? Um, some of these things on the slide may seem obvious, but sometimes the best advice is be good to your mum. The four steps are crucial. Understand where you are going all the way from the conceptual to the strategic to the tactical, and then get the people on the bus. Importantly, and uh, my Morgan Franklin colleagues will uh, roll their eyes at this because I say it so often, authorship is more important than ownership. You need your team to have a voice at what the future looks like, and then they're going to be invested in it and invested in its success. And it's going to be a better approach because it's going to be built on reality. A couple of other items for the Lord uh, live audience. Uh, well, I guess we are taking two. Um, set metrics for what success is going to look like and chart towards it, right? Like understand where you're going both at the conceptual level, but also at the really specific level. And so understand what, what, levers you're moving and how they're changing things. And avoid groupthink. Get outside your organization. Of course, you can think about external providers, um, but also think about groups like ACG or FEI or user network groups for your ERP or even your neighbor. These are all different people that can be engaged as part of the story and try and drive what you're looking for. So with that, we have our last polling question. Where are you in your P2P optimization journey? Uh, always be optimizing, have a culture of continual improvement and tracking the effectiveness of change and drive future investment strategy. Um, a. B, have implemented changes in the last 12 to 18 months and starting to reap those rewards. C, have a vision for the future but have yet to implement. And D, starting to assess where we are versus where we need to be, but we need help. And E, don't know where to start. Um, now, I would say, generally speaking, all the polling questions don't have a correct answer. But if you were saying that A was your answer, then you're in a pretty good place. Um, but that doesn't mean that any of those other places aren't there. It's just where you are as the process goes. OK, we'll just give that a few more seconds to get across. Uh, Brennan, any thoughts on this question? No, I'm, I'm interested to see the results. I think that uh, C might be a, a popular answer. I think there's so much talk around automation optimization right now that I think a lot of organizations and leaders are thinking about it. 
Um, but I don't know that, that there's been a lot of action taken on it yet. So I'm interested to see, see the spread. Yeah. I think, yeah, more often than not, we end up being in conversations where we're in C or D. Um, yeah. But that's the nature of things uh, and where people are sort of engaging us. And I, I think the other thing that's probably worth noting around all the content that we've talked about, and we've given you some thoughts around our methodology and our perspective on the market and the processes and best practices, um, you can leverage people to help you implement these things. But part of the reason why we wanted to give you all that insight is so that you can think about how you self-select and self-drive some of this stuff yourself. So let's see where we got to with the answer. All right. And Brennan is the lucky winner at 38% for the, the, the vision for the future, but yet to implement. Um, and fantastic to see so many people in A where they feel like they're really driving where they want to be. Okay. Well, I think that is it from us. I may pass back to Stephanie to close us out. Unless there's any other questions. Yeah, you do yeah, have a question in the Q&A. Uh, okay, cool. So which country are you seeing ahead of the game? Um, I mean, I guess it depends in, in some respects um, what aspect we're talking about here in terms of process, technology, all those different things. Um, we do a lot of our operations uh, with the US and uh, I mean, I think that more often than not, they are going to be some of the leading markets, but we are seeing, you know, particularly in some of the technology innovation and some of the different tools even um, that there's different countries in Europe that are really driving some heavy arbitrage and effectiveness there. Um, and then from an industry point of view, uh, I guess financial services, are probably the one that I'm seeing driving a lot of this and manufacturing. Um, and, and that's really driven by, I think, size and complexity and, and uh, repeatable activity. Uh, Brendan, anything from you? No, I think that's, uh, that's well covered, John. And then just as a, a, a last check, Nathalie, any, any, uh, any thoughts from you on that question or? All right, I think we lost Nathalie um, from uh, IT issues as we went, but it was still great to, uh, to have you all here today and uh, thanks for your time. Yeah, thank you all. Awesome. Please thank feel free to, to reach out through LinkedIn or for, uh, look forward to staying connected. Yes, and we do have um, LinkedIn. Um, if you check your speaker bios from your widget or from your uh, toolbar at the bottom of your screen, you can find LinkedIn's for each of our speakers today. Um, and that will also be sent to you um, in our follow-up email, which you were, will receive in the next 24 hours. Um, so wrapping it up just real quick, um, you all needed to attend for 50 minutes, which I think we've hit that by now. Um, and uh, answer three of our full four polling questions. Do not forget to respond to your post event evaluation, which can be found in your toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we do have, or as I mentioned here, we have our, our email that will go out in the next 24 hours. You'll be able to download the presentation from today. Also reach out to the speakers from today if you have any questions or just want to connect. Uh, and then Last but not least, we do have upcoming events. We have two happening next week if you are interested. Um, and we are starting to plan for the fall. Uh, so if you're needing CPE credits, follow along, follow us on LinkedIn. Um, make sure you sign up for our events newsletter uh, to make sure that you receive invites for these events and that way you can register. But with that, if there are no other questions from the audience, thank you all for attending. Thank you to our speakers again. Um, and please feel free to reach out to us if you have any questions post the event as well.